A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Comedy. My name is Cam Edwards. I'm so glad you're with us today. We're going to be talking about, um, well, some of the new rules that uh, anti-gun Democrats want to impose on those exercising their fundamental right to keep and bear arms. You know, we've been talking a lot about these sensitive places, uh, the uh, attempts to uh, deny where those with concealed carry license can unlawfully carry. But, you know, there are still attempts to, I think, avoid uh, what the Supreme Court said in Bruin about who can actually carry a firearm. Yeah, there are a couple of bills, um, one in New York, one in Hawaii, that would impose a, uh, a new requirement uh, for those hoping to either uh, own a firearm or uh, carry a firearm. Mental health screenings and pre-approval from a mental health professional. Yeah. Uh, in other words, before you can exercise your fundamental right to keep and bear arms, you have to um, convince a doctor that you're not insane, that you're not mentally ill. Right. And only those who have uh, done so would be allowed to exercise their fundamental right to keep and bear arms. Now, what's interesting is that this is getting some pushback from mental health professionals, particularly in Hawaii, uh, where yesterday the Senate Committee on Public Safety and Intergovernmental and Military Affairs uh, heard the Bruin response bill that has been uh, introduced. And one of the groups providing testimony. Uh, to this bill, in opposition to this bill, the uh, Hawaii Primary Care Association. Uh, and this is what they had to say, at least part of what they had to say in their written testimony. They said, among other things, Section 2 of the bill would require the chief of police of each county to adopt procedures to determine whether an applicant, quote, has been adjudged insane or not appear to be mentally deranged. To determine this, Section 2 further clarifies that a person who, quote, does not appear to be mentally deranged means that the applicant does not exhibit specific and articulable indicia that would objectively indicate to a reasonable observer that the applicant is not capable of being a suitable, responsible, and law-abiding user of firearms. Such specific and articulable indica may include suicidal ideation, homicidal ideation, or potential dangerousness, including a violent animus towards one or more groups based on race, color, national origin, ancestry, sex, gender, gender expression, sexual orientation, age, disability, religion, or other characteristics, such that a reasonable person would conclude that the applicant harbored an intention to use a firearm in public to attack others rather than for self-defense. The association then goes on to say the standard would be used by the chief of police and the chief's review of the application and all other documentation that would be required pursuant to rules adopted by the police departments and the Department of the Attorney General concerning background checks and mental health screening. If all conditions are satisfied, the license would be issued. The Primary Care Association in Hawaii says we question how the chief of police would come to this determination whether the chief would utilize a medical professional employed by the police department or by private health care providers via an application process. And they added, if it is the legislator's intention that private health care providers be utilized, then the Hawaii Primary Care Association is concerned that the expertise needed by a health care professional to determine whether a person, quote, does not appear to be mentally deranged is quite specialized. Mental health has become so prevalent and nuanced that a primary care physician, registered nurse, or other frontline professional may not have the expertise, nor a sufficient amount of time with a patient to correctly identify the severity of a patient's mental health to the degree necessary for a sound determination of a patient's fitness to receive a firearms license. Uh, for uh, these healthcare facilities throughout the state, there is a severe shortage of mental health professionals, the kind of personnel with the expertise needed for this very important responsibility. Now, the Primary Care Association didn't come right out and say, uh, this is ridiculous. But they did point out some problems, right? First of all, should the chief of police be making a uh, determination about somebody's mental health? The Primary Care Association says no. And in fact, it shouldn't even be up to uh, a primary care physician, that you need somebody who is a mental health specialist, right? You need a psychiatrist. You need a psychologist. 
and there is a shortage of mental health workers in Hawaii. So what does that mean? When individuals apply to exercise their right to keep and bear arms, and they're told it's going to be four months before they can get in to see a doctor uh, who will uh, you know, judge whether or not they are mentally sound enough to exercise that right to keep and bear arms. I mean, if you're an anti-gun Democrat, the answer is simple, right? You wait four months. But I don't think that that's going to stand up in court. Anyway, I, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to this because, again, I want to talk about uh, another piece of legislation as well. Uh, before we get on to New York, though, there is one other uh, part of the Hawaii Primary Care Association's testimony about the Bruin response bill that is worth acknowledging because I don't think they had to say this. Uh, it's one thing for the Primary Care Association to weigh in on this, you know, mental health edict. Uh, but they also go on to say, lastly, we note that on September 30th, 2022, Mayor Rick uh, Blegiardi of Honolulu submitted to the Honolulu City Council a bill substantially similar to Senate Bill 1230 that would address the Bruin decision by protecting, quote, sensitive areas that have been traditionally subject to firearms restrictions. This approach is also similar to a recently enacted law in New York that sought to greatly restrict the areas that licensed firearms may be carried. However, it should also be noted that the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association incorporated filed suit to invalidate the new law, citing Bruin, and then they quote that lawsuit, or they quote the Supreme Court's decision, but expanding the category of sensitive places simply to all places of public congregation that are not isolated from law enforcement defines the category of sensitive places far too broadly. This argument would, in effect, exempt cities from the Second Amendment and would eviscerate the general right to publicly carry arms for self-defense. Sounds to me like the Hawaii Primary Care Association has some objections beyond just the mental health provision, noting that uh, this bill is likely to run afoul uh, of the courts, given that, again, it broadly defines any number of locations that are publicly accessible as sensitive places where concealed carry is banned. Again, I, kudos to the Hawaii Primary Care Association for pointing that out. Uh, the Honolulu, uh, Honolulu Police Department also um, had, quote, concerns about uh, Bill 1230. Uh, Rob Romano of the Firearms Policy Coalition uh, tweeted about this, uh, noting that to some of the objections, uh, or, or concerns rather, uh, sensitive places that will be difficult to enforce, um, character reference requirements. Yeah, that's another that's another uh, provision there of the, uh, you know, don't carry anywhere bill, right? You got you to gotta have references. Uh, and the Honolulu PD says, well, those might not be helpful because they're biased towards the applicant. Who... who is going to submit a character reference that's going to say, oh, yeah, Cam? Yeah, I wouldn't give Cam a license. I, 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 serious, I, that's, that's ridiculous. Uh, and then the final objection, they say, yeah, interviews will use too many resources. Hmm. Now, again, it's worth noting here what some of these objections are, right? The, 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 these are not the objections that maybe you or I would make. They're, they're not arguing from a constitutional standpoint. They're arguing from a practical standpoint. If you're an anti-gun lawmaker, again, your, your job is to make laws, right? It's not to enforce laws. If you make a law that is unenforceable or doesn't work, what do you do as a lawmaker? You don't repeal it. You tweak it, right? You reform it. You close loopholes. That's what you do. You make laws if you're a legislator. But if you're law enforcement, yeah, your role is very different, right? Uh, and if you are, let's say, a, a primary care physician who may be compelled to start providing mental health evaluations for all would be gun buyers, yeah, you you also have some uh, very specific, practical and pragmatic um, reasons to disagree here, right? The 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 the, the staffing levels uh, aren't there. Now, maybe, maybe you can say maybe in Hawaii where gun ownership is relatively rare. But I would argue that gun ownership is relatively rare in Hawaii precisely because of the unconstitutional laws that have been struck down in Bruin and uh, more litigation likely to come. Uh, and as the right to keep and bear arms is recognized, however, reluctantly by lawmakers in Hawaii, the number of gun owners in the state is going to increase. Uh, and that means that the uh, mindset of you know, imposing this mental health uh, check or screening before any gun purchase will lead to lengthy delays. Uh, even in a state like Hawaii, 
In a state like New York, uh, I think it would be exponentially worse. And yet, there's a bill that is sitting right there in the uh, New York State Senate, Senate Bill uh, 4126, that requires a purchaser of any firearm, rifle, or shotgun to submit to a mental health evaluation. So now we're not just talking about concealed carry. Now we're talking about any and all gun purchases in the state of New York before you could legally take possession of that firearm under the terms of this bill. Uh, a purchaser of any firearm, rifle, or shotgun shall submit to a mental health evaluation and provide the seller with proof of his or her approval to purchase such firearm, rifle, or shotgun pursuant to the mental hygiene law. Um, this bill, I will say, is awfully short on specifics. Uh, they say it uh, adds a new subdivision to state code to, quote, uh, require the commissioner of mental health to establish within the Office of Mental Health an administrative process for the mental health evaluation of any individual prior to such individual's purchase of any firearm, rifle, or shotgun. The commissioner shall promulgate regulations which shall include, but not be limited to, provisions relating to mental health professionals approved to perform the evaluation, the process for evaluation, and the development of a standardized form to be used by mental health professionals performing such evaluation to approve or deny any, any individual for purchase of a rifle, shotgun, or a, a firearm. This section also provides for the review of the denial of any individual for purchases or other acquisition of any firearm, rifle, or shotgun. But again, all very vague. We'll, we'll just leave it up to the uh, mental health commissioner in the state of New York to promulgate all of these rules for would-be gun owners as well as mental health professionals. And again, just as in Hawaii, uh, the real question, besides the obviously, uh, you know, <laughs> the obvious constitutional concerns, um, there there is a question of, okay, so who's actually going to perform these evaluations? I mean, this is the headline as of a year ago. New York's mental health system faces workforce crisis. Crisis. Yeah. Uh, Glenn Lieben. CEO of the Mental Health Association of New York State, said last February that COVID-19 has, quote, uh, amplified the workforce drought tenfold. So it was already bad before COVID. It's gotten exponentially worse. Lehman said the staffing shortage, again, of mental health workers is an untenable situation with some programs seeing vacancy rates of 30 to 40 percent. And he said without the workforce, we don't have a mental health system. So again, the state of New York wants to put in place these unconstitutional requirements to begin with. We'll get to that in a second. But beyond the constitutional concerns, again, the, the, the pragmatic concern is, uh, is what happens again if you got to wait four, five, six months in order for you to have your evaluation. And again, for anti-gun Democrats in New York, that's not a bug. That's a feature. The longer they can make people wait to exercise a fundamental right, the more people will say it's not worth it. Forget it. I'm giving up. And that's exactly what the gun control groups and the anti-gun politicians want. Now, as for the constitutionality of this measure, um, supporters of these bills point to language in the Heller decision that talked about, uh, and Bruin as well, uh, that talked about, you know, uh, in Heller specifically, uh, this decision shouldn't cast doubt on any longstanding prohibitions against uh, felons and the mentally ill from owning firearms. The problem, though, is that the Supreme Court and Heller never defined, quote, mentally ill. The federal law uh, says that in order for somebody to lose their right to keep and bear arms because of a mental health issue, they have to be adjudicated as mentally defective. Uh, there's no, and again, that's something that happens, well, it could happen before you own a firearm, right? If you are involuntarily committed to a, a mental health facility, um, you'll lose your right to keep and bear arms regardless of whether or not you're a gun owner. But there is a finding of severe mental illness. It is, um, again, it's not that the federal law says, well, look, if you're taking an antidepressant, you can't own a gun. Uh, if you are, uh, you know, seeing a therapist, you can't own a gun. That's not the standard. But yet that is the standard in essence that, well, no, actually, that, even even that, <laughs> as bad as it would be, would actually be a better standard than the ones that are promoted by the state of Hawaii and the state of New York. Let's just say, for instance, here's another issue with this. Let's just say, for instance, that somebody goes to their local police chief and um, they, they, they get evaluated. 
And the chief says, uh, whoa, man. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I, no, I just, you're too dangerous. I, I don't feel comfortable uh, with, uh, with, with, with approving your uh, license to carry or your permit to own a firearm. Sorry. What happens then? What happens to that individual who has just been deemed dangerous? Under the terms of the Hawaii bill and the bill offered in New York, nothing. <laughs> nothing. A, a, a determination can be made that somebody is unsuitable to own a firearm, that somebody is too dangerous to own a gun, but that doesn't lead to any sort of involuntary commitment. That doesn't lead to any sort of mental health help for that individual, right? It's just a determination that, no, we think you're mentally ill and you can't own a gun. Have a nice day. Now, <laughs> what, is, what, what does that actually solve? Again, speaking from a pragmatic standpoint, Seems to me a much better way to go about this would be to improve mental health access to everyone, right? Uh, but again, that's not something that anti-gun Democrats are all that interested in doing either. Uh, they are targeting gun owners, and they are trying to use this as a cudgel to deprive people of their fundamental rights. And now we get into the constitutional concerns here. So under the Bruin test, the Supreme Court says that a, a law like what's proposed in uh, New York or Hawaii, you've got to find some sort of historical analog, right? There, there, it, it doesn't have to be an exact match, right? You don't have to find some statute from 1868 that says uh, well, you got to be examined by a, by a medical doctor before we uh, let you have a gun. But it has to be substantially similar, both in terms of the goal of that particular law uh, and uh, the means by which that goal was reached. So, again, are there examples from either the time of the founding or the ratification of the 14th Amendment um, that would suggest that pre-screening would-be gun owners uh, for signs of mental illness, or I guess in the 19th century, bilious humors, um, was commonplace or prevalent. No, there's not. Again, th this is sort of a modern invention. Now, we can, you know, talk about um, what to do about dangerous people uh, having access to firearms. But the idea that you have to be pre-approved by a mental health professional before you can exercise a fundamental right flies in the face of how rights work. We start with our right to keep and bear arms. We start with our freedom of speech. We start with our freedom of religion, right? Now, if we, uh, let's say, you know, use the uh, First Amendment as an excuse to uh, publish uh, libelous or uh, say slanderous things, that might not be covered by the First Amendment. Um, similarly, if you have been adjudicated as mentally ill, you might be able to lose access. To, uh, that, that law might be upheld by the courts. Um, but the idea, again, that you've got to uh, go hat in hand and uh, uh, please, Mr. Police Chief, can I have a, a license to carry? Well, not until I've examined you or not until you've waited four or five months until uh, a slot opens up for a doctor to spend an hour with you and determine whether or not you get to exercise your right to keep and bear arms. Yeah, I don't think it's going to fly. But it doesn't mean that uh, anti-gun lawmakers won't put these bad ideas in place where they have to be challenged in court. Um, I am hopeful that uh, Hawaiian lawmakers will actually listen to the uh, concerns and objections of groups like the Primary Care Association, but uh, I have to say I'm not particularly confident that that's going to be the case. We will keep our eyes on uh, both of those bills as well as all of the other anti-gun legislation uh, percolating around the country right now, but uh, let's turn our attention to today's Armed citizen story. Our good deed of the day and our recidivist report, we'll uh, start there with a story out of Little Rock, Arkansas where uh, authorities say a criminal is getting away with stealing things 
uh, because of both a change to Arkansas law as well as overcrowding in the uh, local jail system, KATV in Little Rock, uh, reporting on a string of petty thefts that have been uh, taking place in uh, one neighborhood, uh, the uh, Hillcrest neighborhood of Little Rock. And police say they know who's doing it. Uh, According to KATV, the man is known to Little Rock police officers, known to be a repeat offender, has even been charged for a December 28th theft, uh, his plea and arraignment set for February 14th. However, they say that most of his thefts have not resulted in charges, and he remains free and on the streets and has continued to steal from homeowners' porches and backyards. He's been caught by security cameras in multiple homes, stealing everything from shoes to bicycles, sometimes stealing from three or four properties in one night. Um, But police say there's just not much they can do about it. KTV says, according to a 2010 Arkansas code, a series of thefts committed by the same person on three or more occasions within three days is considered a Class D felony. But in 2020, that was changed to a Class A misdemeanor. So you can steal as much as you want from as many people as you want. And as long as you're not stealing expensive stuff, uh, it's a misdemeanor offense. And misdemeanors right now are being treated very lightly in Little Rock. According to the Pulaski County Sheriff's Office, violent offenders are prioritized. Misdemeanor offenders are only cited at the moment. Uh, They say it's detention center capacities, 1,210 inmates. As of Monday, they had 1,326 inmates in custody. So you've basically got triage going on, right? And the most violent offenders are the ones that are being kept behind bars. Those who are nonviolent offenders, even if they are prolific, are being let loose. Uh, Pulaski County Sheriff's Office says the most effective course of action for affected Hillcrest residents may be to write and submit their own affidavits to the courts. Uh, But I'd say this might also be something that uh, Arkansas lawmakers need to revisit here because it sounds like the reforms are having some unintended consequences. Might be time also to expand the jail facility in Pulaski County. If you don't have enough room for prolific offenders, nonviolent though they might be, then, um, yeah, sounds like you got to add more beds. Now, today's armed citizen story from uh, Harris County, Texas, where authorities say a robbery suspect was shot and killed by his alleged victim on Monday night, uh, happened actually, I guess, this morning, 2 a.m. this morning, uh, in the uh, La Essencia apartments in uh, Harris County. Harris County Sheriff's Office investigators uh, say they're still trying to piece together exactly what happened in this incident. But based on uh, eyewitness accounts, they say deputies uh, say the shooter was a Hispanic man. He was approached by a woman and her boyfriend. Uh, that's when the couple allegedly tried to rob him. The uh, shooter told deputies he managed to get away from the couple and then ran to his truck where he retrieved a gun. Investigators say the shooter then told him that he was approached again by the couple, and that's what led to the shooting. Investigator uh, Mario Quintanilla says when he was confronted once again by the suspects, he shot and killed the black male. We have a Hispanic female that was taken to uh, Lockwood local police station uh, for questioning. Deputies say the shooter was also taken in for questioning, but at this point... Uh, It appears to be a case of self-defense. We'll keep our eyes open for any more details. Again, this happened Tuesday morning, so uh, it may be that more uh, uh, information becomes available over the course of the day. We'll try to give you an update on tomorrow's program. Finally today, our good deed of the day, in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. A D.C. woman who uh, helped to disarm a gunman on a a metro train uh, after this individual, by the way, had already shot three people. Now, D.C.'s Metro is one of those gun-free zones. Concealed carry prohibited by law. Hasn't stopped a number of violent criminals from engaging in uh, serious crimes on Metro property just over the course of the past few weeks. But the law does prevent concealed carry holders from lawfully transporting their firearms on Metro buses, trains, or you know, even setting foot uh, inside any of the uh, Metro stations. So there were no armed citizens. When this gunman started opening fire in the uh, Potomac Avenue station of Metro, instead, unarmed citizens had to step in, uh, including this woman, Shante Trumpet, who was on a train car 
when the gunman who had already again shot and killed one metro worker had uh, fired at others stepped onto the train gun in hand and shante trumpet actually helped to disarm him she said uh when the guy sat down next to her she said the doors of the train keep opening and closing right they wouldn't stay shut at the moment that she saw the door open She also saw the uh, suspect release the grip on his gun. So she grabbed it and was then tackled by the gunman. And then other passengers on the train piled on on top of him. She said, my first thought, I just needed to get off that train. She was able to escape the uh, dog pile, basically, grabbed the gun, threw it off the train. uh, And again, uh, saved who knows how many lives. Um. One of those individuals who was on the train actually reached out to her. Uh, he saw her interview with uh, Fox 5 in D.C. And um, he said, uh, you know, I, I, I want to meet her. I want to thank her. Uh, Tyrell Knight says he's thankful to be alive. And uh, he was able to uh, connect uh, with a trumpet. Brought her a small bouquet of flowers. Said you definitely deserve the recognition because without that happening, we most likely would have been in a hostage situation. And uh, he's right, or worse, quite frankly. Um, I am very grateful that Shantae Trumpet was able to disarm this attacker. But again, I am frustrated beyond belief that Metro continues to deny law-abiding citizens, responsible gun owners, the ability to carry a concealed firearm on the premises when violent criminals clearly have no problem whatsoever violating that edict. Uh, It's not just this shooting. Again, I'm I'm aware of at least two other shootings on Metro property just since January 1st. There was also another incident in late December where an off-duty FBI agent, who was allowed, by the way, to carry a firearm, apparently did shoot someone in self-defense in a Metro station. No charges have been filed in that incident. We do have a lawsuit underway, by the way, in federal court Um, The first complaint was actually dismissed by a judge, but uh, there's been an amended complaint. So that case is continuing. And uh, fingers crossed that one day uh, those D.C. residents uh, and those Northern Virginia residents, Maryland residents who use the metro system, have the ability to protect and defend themselves and others from dangerous criminals there on public transit. All right, that is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program today. We will be back tomorrow with more of the latest Second Amendment news and information from all across the nation. But don't forget to check out BearingArms.com throughout the day. We've got you covered there as well, including uh, Twitter's shutdown of Steve Dane's account, apparently over a hunting picture. Yeah, a new poll showing a majority opposition to a ban on so-called assault weapons, but expect uh, Joe Biden to keep stumping for a gun ban during the State of the Union address tonight. Uh, and so much more. If you like what you see, I'd also encourage you to become a VIP member at Bearing Arms. All you got to do, go to bearingarms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code GUNRIGHTS. You're going to get a significant savings on your VIP membership. And we are going to give you exclusive content you won't find anywhere else. News stories and analysis, because your support does matter. And it really does make a difference. So thank you again. Have a great rest of your 2A Tuesday. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Till then. Be well, be safe, and be free.